After last week, I have a little bit of some trauma, um, the handheld mic. As I mentioned, my Pentecostal brothers are really seemingly good at that. And I've got some Baptist preacher friends. They, they too, uh, are good at that. Me, not so much. Um, I can only do one thing at one time. So, But anyway, so I appreciate the guys uh, working diligently to uh, provide this lapel. And uh, anyways, it's good to see you this morning, Calvary. Um, for those who don't know, I'm sure most of you do, um, but my name's Alex, uh, last name Gonzalez. I don't speak Spanish. Um, I'm that guy, okay? And, um, but anyway, so uh, born and raised here in Texas. Um, I, uh, I, I work for the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention. Um, a long time prior to that, pastoring and even did some student ministry. And uh, I'm grateful to do what I do, um, especially with churches and staff and volunteers in their seasons of transition. And that is exactly um, where you find yourself. Um, but take heart. Take heart in, in that season of transition because while it may be frustrating to, to many it is actually, I think, I'm convinced, an opportunity for um, faith and prayer and leadership to just really show itself through every single one of you. What an incredible opportunity. And in just the, the couple of months that I've been privileged to, to know you and, and even uh, fellowship with some of you, you have some incredible leaders as well. But in that, you you know, nobody likes change or whatnot. And I I get that. Um, uh, But but just be mindful of just this season of transition. Two things, and I like to encourage churches to do this. And I think my first Sunday preaching here back in August, I I might have said this. Prayer and patience, right? Just those two areas. Um, and, And not to get so wrapped up in, you know, what needs to happen today, because maybe behind the scenes, behind the curtain, the Lord is doing something. Now, what that something is, I don't know. And I appreciate Harold reminding us in his prayer that that you would hear from him, not Alex. Now, there's going to be some Alex opinions sprinkled through. Okay, just just swap that. You know, just but it's the word, right? Spirit and scripture are your guide. The son, that is your guide. And let's lean on him. So it's a privilege to be here again. Be patient and be prayerful for your leadership. Um, if you have your copy of God's word, let me invite you to turn to Jonah. Last week we did um, kind of a, an overarching Really just some, some backdrop. We, we looked at the three, first three verses uh, in this book. And um, a powerful book, 48 verses, uh, four chapters. You can read this book in probably um, less than 10 minutes, maybe seven or eight minutes for, for most. Um, but I wanted to provide last week some some backdrop for you, just some context. And, and really, I wish we could have spent more time. Um, let me encourage you to, to do a study yourself, to, to read, to study, to look at um, uh, what some trusted scholars and commentators say about this book. Um, be, because we don't know much about Jonah, but we know that looking at his life, Uh, If I was a betting man, I would say that his life, minus the the prophet calling, right? The prophetic calling on that sense, we would would resonate. We would would be reminded of some maybe choices and decisions in our own life. So this morning, what I'd like to do is chapter 1, verses 4 through... Uh, 17 will be our text. So last week was God's commandment. This week, Jonah's cross. And, and I hope by the end of this, 
sermon, it'll make sense what I mean by Jonah's cross. So read with me verses 4 through 17. I'll pray and then we'll jump in. Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest, right? A, A raging wind, a storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners, these were seasoned shipmen, right, were afraid. So get that in your mind. Uh, Deadliest Catch, I think, that show on Discovery Channel. Ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid. And every man cried out to his God. And threw the cargo that was in the ship that belonged to somebody else into the sea. They wanted to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had laid down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell, as you guessed it, on Jonah. Poor guy, can't catch a break. Then they said to him, Please tell us, for for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country, and what people are you? So he said to them, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Verse 10, Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he told them so. (laughs) See how obvious it is? And they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. I think I said that. You, You know what I mean. And he said to them, pick me up, throw me into the sea, and then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to to land, but they could not. For the sea continued to grow more tempestuous, there it is, against them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, we pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. And do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. These were pagans. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. And then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Verse 17, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Father, would you... Speak to us just for these few remaining moments this morning that you would be pleased in the teaching and learning of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a real quick, real quick recap. Last week, God's commandment. Remember verse 1, a calling for life on every single one of us like Jonah. Maybe not exactly like Jonah, but the church is called to preach the good news. Right? A command to, to preach. Verse 2 of chapter 1. Jonah was called to preach to a violent people. An evil people. The Ninevites. And he knew, he had heard of them. Just like Ananias had heard of Saul. And Jonah <laughs> decided to run in the opposite direction. 2,500 miles to Tarshish. And yet the Lord allowed him for just a brief moment to do so. But because he desired a communion with his image bearers, Genesis 1, that would be Jonah, but it would also be the Ninevites. This is what's hard for us, right? This is where the struggle comes in. So today, Jonah's cross. Just holding your place there. You don't need to, to really turn there. Just let me read um, Matthew 16. Um, or if you have a device and you can find it quicker than me, then that's good too. But just to kind of get a little 
sense of Jonah's cross. What I mean by this, Matthew chapter 16, Jesus lays down these very difficult words. Verse 24 through 26. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. You see the rub? You see the the tension? The plot twist right here? Let, Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever desires to lose his life for my sake will find it. This paradox that we are in. For what profit is it a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Let's read 27, 28. For the Son of Man will come in His glory, in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He will reward each according to His works. Not for salvation purposes, but for kingdom expansion purposes, right? Right? He he will reward. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. My point is, die to self. That's really what we're seeing here. Acts chapter 9, verses 13 through 16. Ananias. We see it all throughout Scripture. Paul in the letter to the church at Philippi. To live is Christ, to die is gain. So what I want to do is give three different angles or views, camera angles, if you will. Um, Three different perspectives. Number one, the Lord's dominion. Number two, the sailors disturbed. And number three, the prophets disciplined. The Lord's dominion, the sailors disturbed, and the prophets disciplined. First and foremost, verse 4, and then verse 17, or at least the first half of 17, is the Lord's dominion. Look at verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea. There was a mighty storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. This wasn't just an ordinary ship. This was a ship that could handle multiple crew members, but also probably thousands of pounds of cargo, product. We don't know who they were shipping for. Chances are it was some of their stuff, but it was for a retailer. I don't know, maybe Gap. Or is Gap still in business? I don't, I have no idea, but you, you know, uh, or if you have kids, you shop at dad, at least for us dads, we shop at Kohl's, um, or you know you're a dad of a 16-year-old daughter when you shop and get your shirts and socks at Walmart. Right? The only thing I spend money on for me is my shoes because I have such bad feet. Right, So I don't know. Maybe they were shipping some high quality leather shoes. I, I don't know. But it wasn't just an ordinary ship. It wasn't a fishing boat, although they probably fished. But the storm was so great. Right, The Lord's dominion. <clears throat> but we also see it in verse 17, <clears throat> the first half. The Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. We'll pause there. This is the Lord's dominion. Psalms 107, 25. The Lord commands the winds. He commands the waves. Listen, He is sovereign over all or He's not sovereign over all. You get to choose. And yet still, 2,000 years after Christ and some 27 150 years after Jonah, people astonishingly still reject. I I get it. I understand. It's unbelievable. These fairy tales, these mythical, these allegories, these parables, whatever some might call. As I mentioned last week, yes, and even some Bible colleges and some seminaries across our great nation, this is what's being taught. As if some man had a bad dream and wrote these. And if you remember from last week in Matthew 12, Jesus pointing back to Christ. Or excuse me, back to Jonah, right? And then, and then Jonah is a foreshadowing of the Messiah. 
We see it all throughout the prophets. This is why as many and as popular as some, and I, and, and I, and I never want to get on preachers, right? That's just not what we do, or at least in our world. I won't mention names, but, but, but there are some popular brothers who I know who mean well, who, who, who will tell you to unhitch the Old Testament. That probably gives you an indication of maybe who. Just Google it and you'll find out. I'm sure they mean well, and I, I know they're pleasant people. What I'm trying to tell you, because of the Lord's dominion and all throughout Scripture, because He commands the winds and the wave, because He commands the whale, it wasn't a whale, it was a big fish. We can't unhitch the Old Testament. We can't unplug the Old Testament. They point... These letters, these, these prophetic oracles, these writings, this poetry, this history, it all points to Jesus. Every single word. This is the Lord's dominion. Why would I want to even mess with the possibility? Because sometimes I'm just too smart for my own good. The Lord's dominion. We, we see this all throughout Scripture. He is the one who gives and takes. He is the one who allows you and I to be a part of whatever it is we're a part of. The good, the bad, the indifferent, the ugly. The struggle, the successes, right? The mountaintops and yet the valleys. Die to self is ultimately what he's trying to teach Jonah what he's trying to teach us. Do you receive the Lord's dominion? Do you acknowledge his dominion? <clears throat> Let me just say this about the fish. I, I, I don't know if I said it last week, but um, every now and then, I, I don't know, if I talk about it, like when I stop for lunch or whatever, something's going to pop up in my news feed about people noodling. You know what noodling is? It's it, listen, it's our friends up north of us, Oklahoma. Um, and my, my dad's from Arkansas, so I can say this. Like, they get in the water, not too deep, in the banks of the water, and they stick their hand in these, like the mud, like these holes where catfish, like, hang out. And I don't mean little bitty catfish. I'm talking catfish that could swallow me. Maybe not noodling, but if you're ever, you know, fishing at the at the at the bottom of a, a dam, you know, and the the catfish that hang out. At least this is what I've been told. Have you seen pictures of those guys? Don't tell me that this can't happen. If it's not a catfish, you've certainly seen images of whales. What's the biggest one? The tiger. Wait, what's what's the big the big whale? The one that's real gentle. Somebody, come on. No, 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 no. It's like larger than a bus. Just a big well. Okay, yeah, I'll go with that. I don't. Do your research, Alex. Ross, where are you at, man? I thought you were going to help me, bro. He does. Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. You don't know whales, man? Okay, bugs. All right. I'm bugging you right now. So, all right. Lord's dominion. Number two, that's the first vantage point. Number two is the sailors disturbed. Now we're going to look at a few different verses. Uh, five, uh, verse five, um, the first two little sentences there, maybe. But let's see. Then the mariners were afraid. We see it, right? And every man cried out to his God. I mean, these were, these were the men. These were, these were a man's man, right? Uh, I was talking to our brother... Um, who helped build this building some uh, years ago. And, and I'm like, it, it just, I'm, I always admire guys who can build things. Like, that's a man's man. Um, I can build nothing. I get excited for me when I change the light bulb, the air filter, and that's about it. I don't even mow my own yard. That's because I'm usually 
busy, but but I admire guys like that. They're men's men. Am I saying that right? That's what these sailors were. They were afraid and they cried. When was the last time you were afraid and cried? Look at verse 6. So the captain, so now the big boss, he came to him, Jonah, and said to him, What? are you doing? He actually calls him sleeper because he probably doesn't know his name. Right? And he, like God in verse 2, says arise. I mean, Jonah is getting pounded and pelted with this message. Get up! Go! Alex, stop running from me! I mean, even a non-believer. And then he says, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. I mean, that's a sensible request. And then they decided to cast lots. The lot fell on Jonah. They even, they were considerate. Like these these men were, again, tough. They were rugged. But they were smart, obviously, because, I mean, they valued human life. What, What do we do with you, Jonah? And he tells them who he is and who he serves and where he's from. And then he tells them to throw me overboard, right? And, and what I love about this is in verses 13 through 16, after Jonah tells them, hey, this is how you solve your problem. Throw me overboard. It's like they ignore him. In verse 13, nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land. They tried to spare this man's life. Non-believers. The sailors disturbed, right? Even though they were disturbed and distracted, they still wanted to preserve this man's life. They had common decency. It is true that non-believers can be nice. It is, and I know you know that, right? Um, It is true that people who don't worship God can be sensible. It, It is okay. Sometimes it's us as believers who offer the stiff neck and the stubbornness, and we we tend to not often and. And certainly not Calvary Bastrop, because the hospitality that I have sensed from you um, has been incredible. And listen, I've had those days where I was just cranky. I, I know you haven't. Uh, I was just tired. I was, what do they say, hangry? Yeah. And I, lo- I love this, that the men just, wanted to spare him. And they cried out to the Lord. We pray, O Lord. They're they're not believers, right? They're not believers at this point. But they're crying out to him. They, They wanted to be spared themselves for the guilt. So they picked him up, threw him into the sea. And the sea ceased from raging. And then the men's fear transitioned. Like this awe, this reverence to to the Lord. And then they took vows. We don't know if they're believers at this point. I mean, arguably, maybe they were. I have no idea, but it seems like they were. And then we see the prophet's discipline. Verse 9, verse 12, verse 17, at least the second half. Right? By the way, what's really cool about verse... Really 5B, let me back up. But Jonah had gone down, lowest parts of the ship, laid down, and was fast asleep. Some commentators want us to believe, and, and I mean that respectfully, like, like I believe it. Like he was running, he was sinning so much that the weight of sin and the, the, the weight of rebellion exhausted him. I've been there. Maybe some of you have been there. This is eerily similar to Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12, where...
the, the waves come crashing in on David. The waves come crashing in to, to a point of exhaustion. Everybody has a fear of, you know, how they don't want to pass away. Fire, drowning, whatever it is. I couldn't imagine. Mine's being eaten by a fish. Um, <laughs> I'll eat them. By the way, I don't like catching them because I can't touch them and I can't clean them. And if you can't touch them and clean them, you don't need to be catching them, right? Um, but I'll eat them. If you want to bring them, I'll eat them. Hebrews 12, 3 through 11. Be not surprised at the Lord's chastening to his children. What we need to be surprised at is when the Lord doesn't discipline us. So... What does this do for us? These three, these three vantage points, these three viewpoints. I love the picture that the Lord paints for us. Let, let me just close with this. The great Charles Haddon Spurgeon preached a sermon based on this narrative here, this this tale, this, this story, rather. He says a couple of things. He says, sinners make desperate efforts to save themselves, naturally so. He says, the fleshly efforts of awakened sinners must inevitably fail. I, I still can't figure out why he mentions that. And then he says, the soul's sorrow will continue to increase as long as it relies on its own efforts. This is what he's saying about Jonah. The soul sorrows as long as it relies on its own efforts. Some of you, some of us, are relying on our own efforts a little too much. I mean, where's the faith fit in? He says the way of safety for sinners is to be found in the sacrifice of another on their behalf. You see the sacrifice some 800 years later on Calvary. A virgin birth, God incarnate, coming to earth to live a sinless life for only 33 years to bear the sins of humanity on those who might believe in him. But not just a belief to check off a box, a belief that our lives would be radically transformed with the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And, and yet some of us still act like the day before. I, I know, I know, I know, I know, and I can relate like Jonah and maybe some of you because this is where I find myself. It, it's what, what I think is best. It's where I want to go. It's what I want to say. It's who I want to hurt to ultimately protect myself because I've been hurt. I've been cursed. I've been damaged. And maybe for some of you, this is all too real. You say, well, well what do we do with this? All right? What do we, what do we do? Number one, just acknowledge that God is sovereign over all below and above. When was the last time you reveled in that, that you cherished that, that you acknowledged that? And then secondly, God's persistent in his redemptive plan, the salvation of the nations and the extremes that he will go are just that extreme. Where do we find ourselves? This is the cross Jonah has to bear. And you, me, have we taken up our cross?